from WXII 12 News. This is breaking news. Breaking news on this Thursday mm -hmm. out of the Middle East. The head of Iran's elite military force, General Qasim Soleimani, is dead tonight, killed in an airstrike on Baghdad International Airport. And Iran is blaming the United States. And just moments ago, the Pentagon confirmed the U.S. was behind the uh, strike at the discretion of the president. State media says the missile attack killed at least seven people, including Soleimani, who was considered one of the most powerful men in the Middle East. Shortly after this news broke, the president tweeted this, an American flag, no text. In less than 30 minutes, it has received close to 90,000 likes. On the flip side, Senator Chris Murphy, a Democrat from Connecticut, writes, Soleimani was an enemy of the United States. That's not a question. The question is this. As reports suggest, did America just assassinate without any congressional authorization the second most powerful person in Iran, knowingly setting off a potential massive regional war? And tensions were already escalating between Washington and Tehran. Earlier this week, protesters from Iran-backed militia groups stormed the U.S. Embassy compound in Iraq. There is a local component to this as well. An additional 650 American troops from Fort Bragg are now on the ground in the Middle East. As Defense Secretary Mark Esper warns, there are indications Iran or its proxies may be planning more attacks. The troops will remain there as long as necessary. We have all the capabilities inherent in the United States military to either respond to further attacks or to take preemptive action if additional attacks are being prepared. The U.S. says pro-Iranian rioters lit fires and broke through an outer wall, sparking two days of violent clashes. Through the embassy itself, it remained secure. Demonstrators packed up and left the compound last night. They were responding to deadly U.S. airstrikes against Iranian-backed militias in Iraq, who had previously attacked U.S. forces, killing an American contractor. Critics blame President Trump's policy decisions for the escalating violence, including pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. President Trump this week directly threatening to retaliate while insisting he does not want war. Uh, out there tonight, we have rain. You're looking at downtown Mount Airy, and it is a cool rain, too, with temperatures largely in the 40s across the area. We've seen occasional rain since earlier this afternoon. It will continue heading into the overnight. Current temperature in Mount Airy, 43 degrees with calm winds and, of course, the rain coming down. You do see a little heavier pocket now starting to push into Wilkes County as well as Davie County. So we'll see those showers passing through. We've got moderate rain from Ashboro to Winston-Salem to Kernersville. Also north and east of Danbury, a pocket of moderate rain there sliding out to the west. Steady rains continue from Sparta down to Elk and over to Hillsville. And there's that heavier rain right now right over Wilkes County. So we're going to continue to keep rain in the forecast overnight. I do think over the next several hours we'll see some of the heavier rains start to move away and we'll see less coverage of wet weather in the morning, but still some spotty showers around as well as some patchy fog and and temperatures that are in the low to mid 40s. I'll be back to talk about what could be a rainy Friday and a look ahead at the weekend coming up. Lady, thank you to Greensboro mm -hmm. now where a community is still in mourning tonight after a stunning New Year's Day triple shooting that claimed the lives of two young children. Brittany McKinney is accused of killing 61 year old Jerry Griffin in his home along Sweet Birch Drive, along with 10 year old Mackenzie McKinney and two year old Serenity Rose. Police discovered the victims yesterday morning when someone requested a welfare check at that home in the city. There's now a memorial with flowers, messages and balloons that's been placed at the mailbox in front of the home where that family once lived. The suspect, Brittany McKinney, made her first court appearance today on her 29th birthday. She didn't speak at all during the hearing, and she has not been eligible for bail since her arrest. The judge says she is still not eligible for release. McKinney faces the death penalty if convicted. Prosecutors say she told investigators she's been dealing with substance abuse problems. Her next court date is February the 11th. We're also learning this evening that McKinney was arrested at the Sitco off of Wendover Avenue for a hit and run that occurred on Wendover the same day as those homicides. No one was hurt in that hit and run, but officers say McKinney was driving Jerry Griffin's vehicle, the 61 year old man she's accused of killing. Police say they connected McKinney to the homicides after arresting her for the hit and run. Greensboro police say they aren't releasing any more details about McKinney's relation to the three victims, just saying that she knew them. And coming up in our next half hour of news, you'll hear from a neighbor still shaken up by these killings, along with her young daughter, who knew one of the victims. Our coverage continues right now on our website and on the WXI 12 mobile app. You can see all the information we've learned from investigators and court documents as well.
As 2020 kicks off and the holiday season moves out of town, calls to domestic violence hotlines start to come in. Local experts say the month of January is particularly busy for people coming forward to begin a new chapter in their lives. Our Brandon Bates is in Winston-Salem this evening with a look at how prevalent domestic violence is and why people so often decide to come forward now. Well, domestic violence is a huge issue in the state of North Carolina, with over 43% of women and over 19% of men experiencing this. And now domestic violence experts are telling people to come forward and get help. It's a huge deal, but the average person doesn't necessarily realize that because it, there's still a stigma attached. On average in the U.S., more than 10 million people are physically abused by an intimate partner, according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It happens all too frequently, unfortunately. Meredith Hooks is the program director for Safe on 7. It's a domestic violence center in Winston-Salem. She helps about 1,000 clients with protective orders a year in Forsyth County. It spans uh, racial divides, socioeconomic status. Uh, you see it in every aspect of the community. She says there's a myth that during the holidays, domestic violence increases. Based on my experience in the field, January is extremely busy. From what she's seen in her 15 years, victims try to avoid reporting abuse during the holidays, but once they're over, they're ready to take action. National data shows that it takes a woman, on average, about seven times to go through an abusive situation before it's reported. The sooner you leave, the better. And if you are somebody dealing with this right now, she has a message for you. There should be no shame in seeking help. Um, nothing you did justifies the behavior. And if you need help getting out of a domestic violence situation, you can call the domestic violence hotline. That number is 1-800-799-SAFE. Reporting in Winston-Salem tonight, Brandon Bates, WXII 12 News. Brandon, thank you. Guilford County authorities tonight say a Gibsonville homeowner shot a person who tried to break into his house this morning. The sheriff says it happened at about 615 on Brightwood Church Road. Deputies are still looking into this. A shooting in Rural Hall lands a man in the hospital and another man in jail. The Forsyth County Sheriff's Office tells us a deputy was called out to a shooting along Woodbriar Path around 10 o'clock last night. The deputy performed life-saving measures on the victim who was taken to the hospital and is stable tonight. John Page is charged with assault with a deadly weapon and violation of a domestic violent protective order. Happening now, High Point investigators are looking for the person who fired a shot that grazed a woman. This happened shortly before 5 this evening in the 400 block of Gordon Street. That woman had to go to the hospital. Numerous other violent crimes are also under investigation tonight in the same city. A group walked through several neighborhoods in High Point today asking for anyone who might have information to come forward and help police. The High Point Community Against Violence group focused on Eskdale Drive and Sharon Street. That's where two people were shot and killed on Christmas Eve. The group also looked for homes that might have had security cameras rolling in hopes that they potentially captured at least part of the crime. Police in High Point say $200,000 worth of drugs are now off the streets tonight. Officers obtained a search warrant for Tariq Woods home on Elwood Drive. They say they found 227 grams of heroin, 27 grams of ecstasy and 217 grams of mushrooms. Commitment 2020 now. President Trump's re-election campaign says it raised $46 million in the final quarter of 2019. His campaign also $1.27 million in cash on hand, the most of any 2020 candidate. And even after getting impeached by the House, the numbers are rising. President's campaign manager says the impeachment has actually brought in more contributions from supporters. Senator Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side reports a fourth quarter haul of $34.5 million. Pete Buttigieg follows with a report reported 24.7 million. After that, Joe Biden with 22.7 million, but he maintains his front runner status in national polls. Senator Elizabeth Warren put out a plea for money last week after reporting 17 million for the quarter. Andrew Yang raised 16.5 million in that same time period. The crowd of Democratic presidential candidate is a bit smaller tonight. Julian Castro has dropped out of the race. He's calling it quits after failing to qualify for the last two debates, acknowledging his campaign is not getting the traction that it needs to keep going. Democratic presidential candidate Michael Bloomberg is making a stop in North Carolina. The former New York City mayor is going to open field offices in Raleigh and Fayetteville. He also will announce plans for economic security and employment for veterans during a stop in Fayetteville tomorrow. Bloomberg opened a field office in Charlotte last month. 
New at 10, congressional lawmakers from our state are urging the Supreme Court to take another look at the 1973 landmark Roe v. Wade ruling, which legalized abortion across the country. Senators Richard Burr and Tom Tillis, along with Triad Congress members Mark Walker, Ted Budd, and Virginia Fox, are all among the Republican leaders who've added their name to a filing to the nation's highest court. They want the justices to reconsider, if not potentially overrule, this decision. In all, 39 GOP senators and 168 predominantly GOP members of the House made their plea in a friend of the court brief. The case does not directly challenge Roe v. Wade, but abortion rights supporters fear it'll give the justices an opportunity to chip away at abortion rights as a whole. Voter ID still isn't a done deal in North Carolina, despite a voter approved constitutional amendment. Attorney General Josh Stein says the state is going to appeal a federal judge's ruling that blocks the photo identification law from going into effect. But Stein's office released a statement today saying they're going to wait until after the primary in March to avoid confusion. Tuesday, a federal judge blocked the photo ID requirement pending the outcome of a lawsuit. Civil rights groups say the law is discriminatory, but legislators say it secures elections. Mail-in absentee voting starts in less than two weeks.